Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWer and this is Grubs Up, a brief history of food in medieval Ireland. I'm sure you can hear I have a cold, so apologies in advance for my nasally voice. As Christmas approaches, this podcast takes you into the world of medieval food to see what might have been served up for both rich and poor. Before we get into this, I want to say a massive thank you to all of you who funded my upcoming book, 1348 A Medieval Apocalypse, The Black Death in Ireland. The crowdfunding campaign, which ended last week, was a massive success. I had aimed to get about €4,000, but in the end, the campaign brought in over €6,500. Thank you very much for your support. It means a lot and ensures lots of new exclusive material is on the way in 2015. I will be in touch in the coming weeks with all of you who funded the book about rewards. Thanks again. I really appreciate your support. Sometimes it's hard to grasp just how much the world has changed in the last few centuries. And this is certainly the case when it comes to food. When we sit down to dinner on Christmas Day, many of the components of that dinner we will eat were completely unknown to our medieval ancestors. Turkey and cranberry sauce only arrived in Europe after the conquest of the Americas following Christopher Columbus's crossing of the Atlantic in 1492. Indeed, it was only after this as well that the potato arrived in Ireland. That said, If you could afford it, there were plenty of delights to fill a plate in late medieval Ireland. For the rich in medieval society, the culinary options available was far more diverse than you might expect. For example, one of the most powerful people in 14th century Dublin was Gilbert de Bullignop, prior of one of the richest religious foundations in the town, the Priory of the Holy Trinity, better known today as Christchurch. Now Gilbert was able to afford the best of foods available. From surviving priory accounts, we know, for example, that on a Thursday in Lent in 1338, he was joined for dinner by a canon from the nearby St. Patrick's Cathedral. As it was Lent, these clerics could not eat meat, but nonetheless they enjoyed a sumptuous meal that included bread, wine, ale, herrings, turbot, plaice and trout. For dessert, they supped on rice in almond milk. While rice and almonds were a luxury, this was by no means the only extravagance the prior Gilbert enjoyed. He also ate foods flavoured by ginger and saffron. On another occasion, he dined on imported figs. When not constrained by Lenten prohibition on meat, the prior enjoyed fine meals of meat. In nearly 1338, on the feast of St Agnes the Virgin, he ate with two officials from Dublin. They enjoyed a meal of two cooked capons, which are roosters, castrated when young, a mutilation that produces succulent meat. On other days he enjoyed pasties, pies, roast fowl and salted eels. Accounts from other wealthy monasteries mention larks roasted in cinnamon and cloves and geese cooked in garlic. While Ireland was more remote than most parts of medieval Europe, it was still heavily integrated into European trading networks. Since at least the 10th century, spices and flavourings were imported from across Europe and Asia to Ireland. Along with cinnamon, cloves and pepper, those who could afford it could also buy ginger and olive oil, as well as other goods brought in from the Mediterranean. Now delightful as this food may sound, the vast majority in medieval Ireland could not afford these delectable treats and survived on far more banal food. The table of poorer peasants, for example, was far less exciting and varied very little throughout the year. The standard dish of later medieval Europe was something called pottage, made from peas, beans, onions, leeks and kale. It was augmented with meat on special occasions when it was affordable. Pottage, therefore, was a sort of vegetable stew, which was relatively healthy. However, there were adverse side effects, particularly from the large amounts of bread people ate with the pottage. The poor would rarely, if ever, have been able to afford bread made from wheat, but instead ate cheaper breads made from corn and rye. Such breads, baked from poorly saved flour, had serious long-term health ramifications. It frequently contained large amounts of grit from millstones, as was poorly sieved. Chewing this grit-laden bread had a detrimental impact on teeth, and indeed on wider health. 
the skulls of human remains found in excavations from 13th and 14th century Dublin had revealed extremely worn teeth to such an extent that the dental pulp had been exposed. This would have resulted in excruciatingly painful infections and abscesses. Such afflictions would have affected the rich, but to a much lesser degree, as they enjoyed bread that was of a far greater quality. On occasion, for example, Prior Gilbert, who I mentioned earlier, ate something called pandaman, a very expensive bread made from wheat flour that had been sieved several times. While pottage may have been unquestionably plain and the bread rough, it was by no means the worst food available. Some people were reduced to eating far less appetising meals. The very poor, who worried more about whether they ate rather than what they ate, often took their life into their hands when they dined. This was particularly the case in towns, where the poor, lacking their own homes or pots to cook in, ran a gauntlet by eating from the medieval equivalent of takeaways. Indeed, in the medieval period, the whole concept of eating out was generally frowned upon, being a sign that someone could not afford to cook or eat their own meals. Takeaway foods in the medieval period were nothing short of lethal in the absence of food inspectors. The famous Canterbury Tales, written in the 14th century by Geoffrey Chaucer, mentions fly-infested pie shops where one could buy reheated soggy pies, while another contemporary poet, William Langland, mentioned how the poor of London were poisoned with bad food. Similarly, in Kilkenny, laws that date from the 14th century specifically mention a punishment for cooks who boil meat or fish in bread or water, or in any other way, not fit for human consumption. The mention of cooking meat and bread is presumably a reference to pies. There is also specific references from Kilkenny to those who sell foods after they lose their nature and reheat them. It's easy to see how such food could easily lead to poisoning. On that note, I'm going to finish this brief account of food in medieval Ireland. Thanks for listening to the show throughout 2014 and tune back in next year when I will return to the story of the Norman invasion. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Until 2015, Slán. Slán.